few weeks. Last Sunday morning in Sunday school, I talked about the ten ways that you're being monitored and uh, tracked and 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 uh, uh, all uh, information kept on you on a database and so forth. This morning, I'm going to go back over some of the material we've covered about the uh, the uh, enormous apostasy that's going on in the uh, in the evangelical church. Scripture says, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. If you'll notice, the scripture says you can't convert them. You can't get them right. The scripture does not say to try to go in their midst and evangelize them and reform them. The scripture says turn away from them. Now, when the Bible says something like that, there's a reason for it, and that is that um, once this happens to an individual, they reach a certain line. Let me show you where that line is. In the book of Romans, if you'll turn there with me, we have, which is a, which is a hopeful thing, uh, the idea that, you, that as long as there's breath in a, in, a, in a body that, you know, you can do something to help them, and you always have hope. And that's a good thing, that you try to have hope. But that's not altogether scriptural. In the book of Romans, chapter number 1, verse number 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, the debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Now watch this. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is a reprobate. This is where God says, turn them over. Only God knows that time. Only God knows that heart. God's the judge of that, not me. I'm not the judge. Hallelujah. I don't have that responsibility. Thank God that's one burden I don't have to carry. I'm not the judge. But the Lord says that there does come a time when uh, an individual can reach a point where there's really nothing that you can do for them. If you look at 1 John chapter number 5, I'm giving you three separate illustrations here in the Scripture to show you how that popular theology may not necessarily be scriptural theology. In 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So there it is in Scripture. And as I say once again, the Almighty is the only one who knows that point, and he knows when, he, when an individual has reached that point. Now, uh, a little bit of Bible, a little bit of church history will bring you back to the, to the 19th century, back to the 1800s. And uh, you'll find that uh, all of the mainline Protestant denominations were uh, in vogue at that time. Uh, they'd come about uh, from the Protestant Reformation, from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, and the Lutheran Church, and uh, the, uh, uh, the Baptist who weren't necessarily Protestants, they've always, uh, people have been around who believe like Baptist. 
I'm not a Baptist brighter. I do not believe that John the Baptist was the first Baptist. Don't believe that for a minute because he wasn't even a member of the body of Christ. But people have been around for 2,000 years who, who have believed like Baptists. They may not have believed everything Baptists believe. And the fact of the matter is, which Baptist are you talking about today? <laughs> because Baptists don't even agree among themselves about what they believe. But uh, to teach that the church all came out of Rome is to, is to defy enormous ignorance. Amen. And so I warn you now, don't show your ignorance. And I've heard people say that with a straight face as if they knew, they were, they, they knew what they were talking about, and they don't. Uh, the Protestant Reformation did produce, though, a number of churches and a lot of good people in these churches, no question about that. Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian. The Episcopalian Church came from the Church of England, Henry VIII Church, and uh, the Anglican, which is, uh, which is, the, uh, which is the British uh, uh, counterpart to the Episcopal Church. And all this, and this all came about over a period of time. But in the 1800s, uh, the people, for the most part, who were not part of what you might call mainline Protestant churches, for the most part, they were Bible believers. And you could pretty well find that uh, the, the Southern Baptist Convention back in the 1800s had some strong Baptist preachers. And the early 1900s, some of the finest preachers that ever lived were Southern Baptist preachers. I was saved in a Southern Baptist church, and to this day, the Southern Baptist Convention still has some good preachers and people who love the Lord. But the problem is that apostasy creeps in, and when it creeps in, it begins to erode the very foundation of the faith. And this is exactly what's happened in the latter part of the 1800s when Charles Darwin published his Origin of the Species, why it shook the religious world and the scientific world. And by shaking the religious world, they had to make a decision. Well, now, is this man scientific? Is this, are, is this based on fact? And if this is based on fact, then that uh, brings my book of Genesis into question. And, of course, they had to make a decision. Either the Bible is right or so-called evolution is right. And some compromised and created what's called theistic evolution, which is, a, which is a merger of the two, that God is the creator, but he used evolution. That's the basis of theistic evolution. In 1920-something, uh, 24, 25, 26, somewhere, here, somewhere in Cleveland, in, in uh, Dayton, Tennessee, the American Civil Liberties Union uh, tested the law of the state of Tennessee, which said at the time that only creationism can be taught in the public school system. The ACLU challenged that, and the basis of their challenge was that it is not constitutional to have just one theory taught in the public school system. So the next time you see somebody from the ACLU, ask them when did they change their mind. Are oh, you listening to me? So once they had their little showcase trial down there, and John Scopes, who was not a biology teacher, he was a history teacher. Uh, they had a confrontation between these two lines of thought. William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow squared off. And they squared off in the courthouse at Dayton, Tennessee. And it was more than these two men squaring off. It was the idea of evolution versus creation. And it depends on what history you read as to whether or not uh, which one won. But most of the secularists say that uh, Clarence Darrow made a fool out of William Jennings Bryan. And uh, I don't believe that's hap that happened, but I do believe that William Jennings Bryan, from reading the transcript of what went on, was, not, was nowhere near qualified. He was a good lawyer, no question about that, but he was not qualified to speak about what he was talking about. He couldn't handle it. But, uh, and Clarence Darrow uh, attacked him on the basis that, create, that creationism is a myth. It's a myth, see? That was the idea. That was the, that, was the big, that was the big controversy of the early 1900s. Creationism is a myth. And so uh, William, William Jennings Bryan, who was a Christian, of course took the biblical position and, and said he believed the earth was created in, seven, in six days and God rested on the seventh and all that, you know. And they made fun of him and they laughed him to scorn. And Hollywood has made a number of movies about it since then to try to persuade the public against uh, J uh, Jennings Bryan. But the bottom line is, it shows you what's going on. And that is that there has been a debate in this country ever since 
Charles Darwin wrote his book, The Origin of the Species, there has been a debate about the authenticity, of the validity, the veracity of Scripture. Is the book right? Or is so-called science right? Which one is it? Can't be both right. See, that's the problem. Well, there are those who publicly take a position that they support the Bible, but privately they don't believe it. And the Bible colleges began to fall one right after another. And the Bible colleges be began to produce uh, uh, unbelievers, men who got up in the pulpit and denied the virgin birth, the blood atonement, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the miracles of the Scripture. They denied the Bible because their faith in the Bible had been shaken by so-called science. They denied it. Well, there was a reaction to that. And the reaction to that was the fundamentalist movement. That was the reaction. There's always a reaction to any, any extreme position that's taken. Just like you have seen in the last two years in this country an extreme leftist position. You've seen it now. I mean, you, <laughs> you've got to be living in a cave not to understand the socialist agenda of the far left. That's who you have in the White House. But right now, he's moving back toward the center. Apparently, you know, ostensibly he is. Why? He wants to be elected in two years. But anyway, there was a reaction to this uh, liberalism that encroached in the early 1900s, and that was the fundamentalist movement which went back to the Bible. That's where the Independent Baptist Church came from. That's where the Church of God came from. That's where the Assemblies of God came from. These are branches that came out of this uh, of, of rebellion against this uh, reactionary movement against this liberalism and modernism that began to creep into the church. Well, now in the last uh, 40, 50 years, you might say about 50 years, the church has begun to, begun to soften completely into the position to where now it's comfortable with, with progress and with America has been a very affluent country. I mean, we had a high living standard, you know, making a whole lot more money than we used to make and have more things to buy and more leisure time and all that. That affects people. And from that has developed what's called the evangelical movement in this country, which is a compromise between the, between the mainline liberal Protestant and the fundamentalist movement. Mainline liberal Protestant on one hand, the fundamentalist movement on the other hand, you had the evangelicals who wanted to maintain a dialogue with the world, not completely separate from them, as the Bible teaches you to come up from among them, but to maintain a dialogue with them so they could win them to the Lord. Well, be awful careful with, when people start talking about winning people to the Lord uh, and, 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 and watch their motives, all right? You don't just use anything you please as a motive to win somebody to the Lord. The only one that ever won anybody to the Lord is the Holy Ghost. Our point is to preach Christ and preach Him crucified. Preach the freedom of the Holy Spirit to move. He's the one who wins. But anyway, they, uh, they, the, the evangelical movement developed from that. And now the evangelical movement is about to face its biggest test. Now how many of you know who I'm talking about, the evangelical movement? The, the, the uh, what was it, the president of the evangelical movement or whatever he was just a few years ago, uh, he fell from that position because it was discovered that he was a sodomite. All right, now, you could say the same thing of the independent Baptist movement, that uh, some of the great leaders in the independent Baptist, Baptist movement fell because they were sodomites. You don't condemn a movement because some leader in that movement is, is a sodomite or a pervert or something like that. You can't do that because you're going to find that everywhere you go. I don't care where you go. You're going to find that. I don't judge the Roman Catholic Church on the basis of all these priests that have been molesting boys. All right? The, ba the idea of a, a celibate priesthood has no basis in Scripture to begin with. See? Don't you judge the Roman Catholic Church as you judge the Independent Baptist Church as you judge the Presbyterian Church by the Word of God. See? Not by nitpicking or picking out some little social issue here and social issue there. So now leadership in the evangelical church has swung to a man called Rick Warren. This man's a pastor of a church called the Saddleback Church out there in California, which is one of the mega churches of this age, which is a phenomenon. A mega church is a church that has thousands and thousands of members, therefore having enormous impact and influence and effect upon people. Because the, the, the 
The further you are away from your maturity and growth in Christ, the more you're impressed with people. The more you grow in the Lord, the less you're impressed with people. And the more mature you become, the less you are impressed with what you see with your eyes. You begin to develop spiritual discernment. But right now, Rick Warren has enormous influence. And as I've said to you before, this is nothing personal between Mr. Warren and myself. But it has to do with my responsibility as a pastor and the fact that I believe without doubt that I'm living in the last days. Amen. And that you need to be warned. Amen. And if I fail to warn you about something like this, then I have failed completely. I was castigated, criticized, vilified, and ran through the cleaner because I did not get up and blast the, last the, the, the Passion of Christ, that movie that was made a few years ago on the Passion of Christ, called A Heretic and Everything Else Under the Sun. I've watched that movie probably six or seven times. When, uh, 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 what's his name, it, it, over in Thailand, the missionary we have over there? Tommy Tillman. Tommy Tillman's son, Mitch Tillman, said that he had been to see the movie five or six times and had, and had taken people with him that were unsaved, and he couldn't tell me how many people had been saved from watching that movie. You judge a tree by the fruit it bears. That's what I said to people at the time. I said, look at the fruit that comes out of it. What kind of fruit will it produce? It has had murderers get saved. It has produced enormous fruit for the glory of God. Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, you can see the Stations of the Cross in it. You can see all kinds of stuff in it. You can pick this and pick that. It's all there. It's all there. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't know anything, how many of you know what all 12 of the Stations of the Cross are? Or are there 10 of them? <laughs> if you've got a Roman Catholic background, you do. How many of you know what I'm talking about, the Stations of the Cross? You don't even want to talk about, see? So how in the world is that going to affect you? You see what I mean? The problem is that the brethren can get so strained on some gnats that they will strain out a gnat and swallow a camel and reject something. And you say, well, it was produced in Hollywood by, uh, by uh, what's that guy's name? Mel, uh, Mel Gibson. Well, the Ten Commandments came from Hollywood, too. Cecil B. DeMille. And the truth of the matter is, when that Red Sea opens up in the Ten Commandments, listen, go to some of the Bible colleges in this country or listen to some of the Baptist pastors standing in the pulpit right now in this country, and they're telling people that it was the Sea of Reeds, John Suf, that the Red Sea didn't literally open up. They went up over there and tiptoed around on dry, on a little jump from one little uh, lily pad to the next to get across where it wasn't so deep. That's what they're teaching people. That's what the Bible colleges are teaching people. But Cecil B. DeMille is a Jew. And Cecil B. DeMille, being a Jew, supported his Old Testament scriptures. And he showed that Red Sea opening up just like that and them walking across on dry ground, just exactly like the Bible says they did. My point is this. My point is this. You get caught up on side issues, things that are not that important, and then swallow that which is. How many people voted to put that man in office two years ago who was the most rabid abortionist that ever set foot in the Senate of the United Amen. States of America? Amen. His voting record is worse than the worst. And all you got to do is check it out. All you got to do is check it out. Now he's been in there two years and you've seen what's happened. All right. This man was invited out there to California to the Saddleback Church. This Rick Warren wants to associate himself with Barack Obama. And Rick Warren just recently had a health seminar, and he had three doctors come into that health seminar. One was a Dr. Oz, the other was a Dr. Amen, and the other was a Dr. Hyman. These three men ostensibly were there for the health seminar to teach people about health practices and what they need to do and this and that and so forth and so on. But folks, all you have to do is log on to the internet and look at the program each day. They have the menu laid out for what they went through. They had yoga, meditation, they had all this stuff brought in there. And the yoga that I'm talking about is the Kundalini yoga.
where a serpent coils itself around your spine and its head comes across the top of your head and you receive serpent strength that touches the chakras throughout your body, the chakras that are numbered, these are power points in your body, you are literally connecting yourself with Hindu mythology and demonism. Fifty years ago, this man would have been run out of town. Fifty years ago, he would have never had a hearing. But it's to give you an indication. It's like a thermometer. This is a thermometer. It's like the little canary out there in the cave. This is an indication of how bad it's gotten. If these people can sit there under these three secular doctors that get up and teach demonism to them and indoctrinate them and introduce them into demonism and then turn around and feel good about that, and that church can prosper from this kind of thing, I'm going to ask you this morning. I'll ask you. I'll just ask you. I'm, you know, I've said enough. I've made, I've made my, you know my position on it clearly. How do you feel about that? Are these your brothers and sisters in Christ? Does this man know the Lord? If Rick Warren were truly born again by the grace of God, the Holy Ghost would have stopped him a long time ago. I could no more bring a Buddhist monk in here and have him sitting here next Sunday morning to get up and tell you about uh, spinning a prayer wheel or about praying his rosary. You know, of course, that's where all that came from, don't you? And uh, the, or, 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 or introduce you to the mysteries of his religion and try to find the and try to find common ground with the Buddhist religion and the Christian religion. That's what they're doing today. Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they are creating a one world religion and they're laying the groundwork for its theology. They, great, they lay the groundwork for the theology of a one world religion and once they've laid that groundwork and if you can agree to that then you're part of that religion. You worship your Jesus and you worship your, your uh, you, you meditate through your Buddha or you worship whatever your God is and, and we're all the same. We're, it's just that we receive from our faith tradition like Mr. Gore talks about. Our faith tradition, whatever we grew up with. Here's, the, here's, what, they, here's what it boils down to this. You remember the evolution? Remember evolution? All right. Here's the insidious part about evolution. Evolution is not only biological, the premise, that it's biological. In other words, physical evolution, but it's also social. If they are evolving physically, they are evolving socially. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, this is 2011? Or this is 2000? Or this is, this is 1990? We don't do things like that today. You see what I mean? It's like man is evolving, he's getting better. He's evolving out of his, out of his, out of his, uh, of his archaic wildness. You know, we all came out of a cave. Crawled up out of the water like a tadpole. And all that, see. And it's taken us a long time to get to where we are now. It's that social evolution. That's what they're teaching people. That's what they're preaching from the pulpits. And so this is just the last final step in the social evolutionary process. It's where we all come together and share our religious traditions together. Now, you'll, some of you will say, say to me this morning, well, what's that got to do with me? I mean, there's no, there's no New Agers in my family, and, and you know, and, and we, it has a lot to do with you. And let me show you where. What they're doing out there in California right now has to do with health, okay? Health. Did you know that the United Nations is getting involved in your health? Did you not hear the other day where the federal government has been talking about certain things that it doesn't want you to eat? Haven't you noticed how that the federal government has begun to, has begun to reach into the very food that you're eating? Not, it's, not, it's not so much anymore. The idea for the FDA for a long time was we want to keep your stuff safe, okay? Well, who wants to argue about that? Nobody, you know, we want it safe. Now it's no more about safe. It's about nutrition. It's about what's good for you. In other words, the federal government is want, it wants to tell you what you can and cannot eat. Yeah. 
You know why? Because they're going to control the food supply. And do you know why they're going to control the food supply? Obviously it said no man can buy or sell. But you see, food is connected in mystic religions with worship and with God and with uh, and your spirituality. It has to do with your wholeness. How many has ever heard of holistic healing? You ever heard of that? Holistic healing? Well, as the word implies, it has to do with your whole being, body, soul, and spirit. Therefore, if they're going to heal you physically, they want to heal you spiritually. And they want to heal every part of you. How many like the idea of a federal government coming down and telling you you can't have your french fries anymore? <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. Go back and look at the Constitution of the United States, which is the highest law of the land, which is meaningless to this, to this, to this uh, uh, executive in office right now. But imagine the Constitution. Can you find anything in the Constitution where it says the federal government's going to control what you eat? But you, where did this It didn't come from the federal government. It came from the UN. Haven't you noticed in the last two or three days the news? Did the news media print this for you? That Barack Obama intends to strengthen the United Nations and the ties with the UN? How many saw that? Very few of you did. That's not an accident. There's a reason for that. Strengthen the ties with the UN. How many in here believe this morning the UN cares one whit about the United States of America? They don't care anything about the United States of America, whether you live or die. But it's, it's laying the building blocks for a one world government. So let me say it again, without doubt, this is what I believe. Whether knowingly or not, Mr. Warren is laying the groundwork for this new one world religion. And this one world religion is a synthesis of all the world's religions where they come together and they worship. That's what he's doing. And this didn't happen overnight. The faith has been eroded now for a good 75 to 100 years. When Charles Darwin introduced his idiotic uh, the uh, uh, thesis of evolution, from that point up until this point, the faith has been eroded and the Word of God has been destroyed and faith in it in the minds of so many hundreds of thousands, millions, that they've come to the point now to where they are willing to accept a new definition of God and a new definition of faith and a new definition of reality. And that's where we are. Everything is new. Watch the new terminologies that begin to show up and the new buzzwords. Watch out for them. Watch in the next, in the next year or two for phrases to be coined that you've never heard before. It's just like the term, well, the first time I ever heard the term cost effective, I thought, what in the world does that mean? How many of you remember the first time you ever heard it? And they got a definition for cost effective. It is politically correct. But think about, think about it a minute. Somebody created that term. Say where they created it from. They pulled right out of nothing, put together, and they created a term cost effective. Right? How many remember the first time you ever heard the term homophobia? All right. How many of you remember being preconditioned in your mind for generations that the term phobia was a scientific term? It comes from the Greek word phobos, one of the Greek words for fear. The Greek word is phobos, all right? It means fear. What they do is reach back into Greek or Latin. They take a word or a term. They take it and they assimilate it as their own. They wrap it up in scientific psychobabble and then give it back to you again as if they had created something. Okay? A phobia is an unnatural fear. That's what it is. That's not what the Greek word means. But that's the way they use it. Okay? And I remember hearing phobia, hydrophobia. Okay? All right, what's hydrophobia? Fear of water, okay. But what's that associated with? Rabies. See, 
You've got all these clinical scientific terms that have been fed into the human mind and to the point to where you think this has got to be real. So if I'm a homophobic, that means I have an unnatural fear of a pervert. <laughs> right? <laughs> See how it goes? See how they train your mind? See how they control your thinking? They're going to drop a bunch of new terms and phrases on you. And these terms and phrases are going to be for the new religion, the new world order, the new world coming, the new economic system, the new worlds, the governments, the, the sovereignty of the governments and the states. All these new terms are going to be, are going, uh, that are going to be dropped on you are created so that you begin to speak their speak, their talk. That's what's happening. Once you start talking their talk, once you've said something enough, long enough, and said that term enough, you begin to believe it. Joseph Goebbels said, tell the biggest lie you can tell, tell it often enough, they'll believe it. A lie, the big lie is the one that people will believe. So if you say it over and over and over and over again, you begin to believe what you're saying is true. But go back and research where it came from and find out what it's talking about. And you're going to find out what's going on. You live in a generation where you must force yourself not to think the way this generation thinks. You have to force yourself back into the Word of God and speak as the Bible speaks and think as the Bible thinks. Every time they say the term uh, uh, a, uh, uh, homosexual, you say sodomite. Because the word homosexual is a created term. It's created. Yeah, now it's alternate. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, on and on and on it goes. Okay, so I guess I've laid enough groundwork in here because I'm going to bring up more stuff later. But right now, just to get you kind of uh, uh, trying, to, trying to get your bearings, you know, uh, take a compass in your hand, shoot a, shoot a course on it, an azimuth, and find out where you're going. And uh, it'll pretty well get you where you're headed if you know how to read the compass and, and follow it. And get back on course. Well, that's what we're trying to do today is give you a compass. Uh, you, can't, you can't follow the road signs and the roads. And you can't listen to the crowd that's running around you. They'll lead you astray. You have a book and you've got to stick in the book. The only way you'll keep from getting lost today and confused today is with the Bible. The Bible says this day is coming. It says unprecedented. It's perilous. Perilous times and deception. All right, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 3 with me, and this is going to lead us right into this. And this will lead us right back to where we came from. Matthew chapter number 3, Matthew chapter number 3, and verse number 2. Now this is what's called first mention. And the law of first mention in the Bible, and when I first heard it, I, I wasn't sitting in a class in, in a Bible school, and the first time I heard the term first mention I thought, well, is this something somebody created? Is there, any, is there any real validity in it? Look at it. Verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye. Now, if he'd stopped there, he'd simply had reference to their sins, right? Repent. Get right with God. And John preached that. But if you notice carefully, he brought it something else in here. He said, For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, you see that statement right there? Nine out of ten Bible colleges in this country will teach you that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous and that the terms are simply used interchangeably for no real reason. Now, that's standard fare. That's standard fare. So, if you read kingdom of God, then read kingdom of heaven, they, they mean the same thing. They don't mean the same thing. And this is what I want to try to show you as we study the Bible because this will bring you to the very point we're at today. It's about a kingdom. It's about a kingdom. And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Who did he tell that to? Pontius Pilate. My kingdom. Pilate said, are you a king? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's when Pilate looked over and said, I've got a guru in front of me here. You know, we've got, we've got a teacher here. We've got, we've got some kind of a mystic in front of me here. He didn't have a clue what was going on, but he knew he was no... Uh, insurrectionist. Pilate said, what is truth? All right. The kingdoms of this world 
in Revelation 11. I want you to turn there with me now. In verse number 15. We start with John the Baptist preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We end in Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. The seventh angel sounded, and there were given, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now I want you to hold your place. You, you, can, you don't have to hold it, but turn to Matthew chapter number 4 and verse number 8. Matthew 4, 8. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now in Revelation eleven fifteen, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. How does he get them, preacher? He gets them when he comes on a white horse with a sharp two-edged sword and blood flying as high as a horse's bridle. They will never be given to him voluntarily. The earth the men of this earth and those who hold the reins of this earth will never give the kingdoms of this world to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will have to take them. That's what the second advent's about. The first advent was when the Lamb of God came into the world to die on the cross and give himself so that we could be saved. The second advent now, advent, is when he comes and takes the kingdoms of this world unto himself. What does he want them for? What follows when he takes the kingdoms of this world and they become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, he literally reigns over the kingdoms of this world for a thousand years. That's what we find in Revelation. That's why he takes them. The greater reason that he takes them, they're his to begin with, he could have taken them any time he pleased. He wants to prove a point. If you'll notice in the book of Revelation, time and again, when God opens heaven and pours out judgments on the earth, the Bible says, neither repented they of their adulteries, of their fornications, of their sorceries. They didn't repent. Judgment, therefore, judgment does not bring repentance. He proves that point in the tribulation. Why does he do that? Because later on it will come into the courtroom. In the, in the millennium, for a thousand years, when the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, he sits on the throne of David and he reigns for a thousand years on this earth. He's the prince of peace. He brings peace to the earth. A king reigns in righteousness. The glory of God is present in Israel. The redeemed of the Lord, which is us, will be reigning on this earth with him for a thousand years. We will have and bear our testimony of where we came from and what we used to be. And we will be spread out over this earth for a thousand years. This is going to happen. But the Bible says that during this period of time, there will be those who kiss his feet publicly and hate him in their heart. Why? He's proven another point. <laughs> there's a reason for the tribulation and there's a reason for the millennium. At the final judgment, when the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, when thou art judged, the Almighty who knows all things from the beginning will have proven to creation that the only way for man to ever know God is for God to know man. The only way man will ever know him is when God comes from where he is to where man is and makes himself known to him. And that beating man, driving man, forcing man will not convert him. 
You won't save him like that. You can't do it. And a lot of well-meaning people have tried it, but you can't do it. It takes something else entirely to get a man saved. Though you give him the greatest kingdom the world has ever known, the greatest king to ever sit on a throne, man still cannot live in peace. Proving another point. We'll deal with those points later on when we get to the actual judgment itself and show it, break it down for you as to why God is judged. So what's going on right now? Does it have to do with kingdoms? Are we building kingdoms? The kingdom, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are entirely two different things. Next Sunday... Lord willing, I'm going to take you through the New Testament and the Old Testament and show you the first man in the Bible that ever sat down on a throne and he had the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven both. He had both crowns on his head. He was well qualified to reign over both worlds at the same time. But he lost that throne. He lost it. And when he lost it, somebody had to come that was able to restore it. <clears throat> the disciples asked him right before he went back to heaven. They said, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to who? Notice what they were asking. It was clearly personal and clearly selfish. Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to the world? To Israel. To Israel. And he looked at them and said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. And so that time will come. It'll come soon. It's right now, the birth pangs. If you can't see that spiritually, folks, I pray that God opens your eyes and that you, get a, that you really get a hold of what I'm saying, that it settles in on you, that we're not looking and waiting for the apostasy. You're right smack in the middle of it. We're not, we're not looking and waiting for the rise of the Antichrist. He's ready to step out right now. The, everything, all the wheels are in motion that's going to produce this one world government, one world governor. He's coming and he's going to, he's just about here. Uh, yes, sir, brother. The Lord's got to.